I said, lady, I have autism. Leave me alone. Radio Free Insmith, episode 272. Hopefully, this will work as sort of a jumping off point for more episodes on the topic of gore grind in the future. Because this week we're talking about Impetigo, perhaps the most important band for the development of that much maligned genre outside of Carcass and Repulsion. If you're not familiar with gore grind, it's the kind of grindcore that's less. <laughs> blah 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 politics and misanthropy and more blah 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 having intercourse with corpses oh no it tends to be a bit more down-tuned and a whole lot sicker in its sonic affectations if you don't know what grindcore is jesus christ radio free insmith episodes 12 74 111 120 122 124 148 179 192 213 and 223 would like to have a word with you <laughs> Is enough to get me to the boiling point! But basically, if you get a death metal album and it's got more than, say, 15 songs on it and most of the songs are under two minutes, you might have found yourself a grindcore album. And Impetigo are to be thanked for grindcore existing, at least in its more modern form, particularly amongst its most gory exponents. That said, oddly enough, hardly any bands really sound like Impetigo at all. They got their own weird, unique little sonic world. Nowadays, people might know them as the band that is mostly responsible for the whole horror movie samples in your grindcore thing going on. And yeah, they were probably the first band to really go hog wild with that. A lot of people see them as sort of a precursor to Mortician in that regard. Although if you were to ask Impetigo themselves, they would see themselves more as contemporaries of Mortician rather than as a precursor because they were really big into the very early Mortician demos. Despite that, Impetigo, as far as full-length albums go, definitely came first. 1990, baby. But even in the earliest stage of their career, those horror movie samples Samples weren't really the same sort of window dressing that they are for most bands that utilize such things nowadays. Instead, they kind of represented where the music was coming from as a whole. You see, Impetigo are probably the most cinematically focused of all grindcore bands. Both of their albums are structured almost like a movie themselves, specifically like a giallo movie, you know, that old Italian gory stuff. In fact, I would almost say that Impetigo is a spiritual musical successor to that entire genre. Because, you know, you get your, your, your nasty the gory movies. It's like, oh, City of the Living Dead, watch out, that guy's head got put into the drill press. Zombie flesh eaters, uh uh-oh, that piece of wood going through that lady's eye, watch out. And it's like really gory and gross, but at the same time, a lot of this stuff actually has quite a lot of artistic merit to it. It's almost like a weird moving painting of a nightmare, and the gore actually makes sense in context. People will call it trash media, but I think there's something a little bit more. The same holds true for Impetigo. They are completely disgusting, even for a grindcore band, and just ultra primitive and nasty. But at the same time, there's actually a lot going on there artistically if you look for it. Case in point, their first album, Ultimo Mondo Cannibale, starts out with the song Maggots that intros with a sample from that part in City of the Living Dead where the window blows open, a big storm of maggots comes in, starts getting everybody's eyes and they're all vomiting and it's all nasty. Goes right into an instrumental to get things going with the album, a tradition that was probably begun with Carcass on their first album, but I believe mastered with Impetigo. The first thing that strikes me about this album, apart from how filthy the guitar sound is, of course, would be the much more subtle and nuanced than would be expected for this kind of stuff drumming. It tends to be very rhythmically complex without being showboaty or technical in the same way tech is. You can't really program this kind of stuff on a drum machine. Okay, maybe you could, but it would take a very long time. Point is, this intro is heavy as fuck. And also, way more structurally complex than you would expect for an instrumental intro to a gore grind album about Italian cannibal films from the 80s. It's got all sorts of little movements and diversions to it. Then the first song proper kicks in, it really gives you a taste of what Impetigo are all about. That being a hefty sense of groove and catchiness and possibly the most messed up sounding vocals of all time. They take the sort of vocal trade-offs back and forth that Carcass was doing back in the day and push them to an almost poetic level with these different alternating stanzas kind of yelling at each other over the music in voices of all sorts of different characters. I saw the little characters in cages and frankly I thought, 
That looks not so bad. Sort of treading the line between being very silly and honestly rather disturbing. Definitely one of my favorite death metal vocal performances. And here we're getting into a further expansion of the precedent established by that intro track of these songs all having a whole bunch of different movements and sections to them, while still maintaining that savage level of primitivism. The only real competition I see with these guys in terms of making structurally complex yet very primitive sounding grindcore would be Blood, the German band I covered back on episode 258. And fittingly enough, one of the only bands these guys did a split release with back in the day was Blood. Both bands are similarly underrated by the metal world at large. Both bands have this heavy component of groove to their sound, but in the case of Impetigo, it's even more primitive than it is with Blood. There's times where they even leave grindcore behind whatever it takes in favor of something that's almost like crossover thrash or even hardcore punk they got this song on there called revenge of the scabby man the whole first part of the song is basically just this one riff which is very hardcore punk sounding it comes in with just bass and drums before launching into the riff proper and suitably heavily fashion if you've heard of gore grind this is like gore garage rock i don't really know what to call this but it sounds awesome vocals are suitably bizarre as befits such morbid material and they just really kind of groove on this riff for a while before the song hits its big major change up and then it jumps back into fast brutal grindcore Impetigo's vocals from the great Steve O'Dobbins are the definition of a love it or hate it affair. Probably a little bit too brutal for most people, but I think they're perfect. And speaking of brutal, this riff has one note in it. It's a one note riff, and yet it's fantastic. And it's a great way of bridging back into that hardcore punk riff from the beginning of the song. So that's about as simple as this album gets, you know, just straight up one, two, three note riffs, total hardcore punk attitude. But they can do that groove thing with their more complex songs as well. My personal favorite of which is tucked away at the end of this album. It's entitled Mortado. And it's about, you know, cannibalism and killing people and all that good shit, like most of this album is. But it's also got the mother of all groove riffs, which you are hearing right now. The hardest thing about being someone that dislikes this particular part is having to tell your dad about it. That means you're gay. It comes out of the groove into another really fast-paced, spazzy part. But this one's a little bit more complex than Revenge of the Scabby Man as evidenced by the number of notes going on in its little bass guitar fill before it kicks in. This one's got this real weird, unsteady, off-time feel to it, highlighted by how wacky those fucking drums are. And it goes right into a super chaotic solo, the fitting of this sort of brutal, early grindcore type stuff. Very repulsion sounding. I, I didn't even see him. I, I love repulsion. Oh yeah, fucking black rough, yeah. But what isn't very repulsion sounding, but is very impetigo sounding, is this awesome groove segue they have leading back into the main riff of the song, which, as yes, you heard earlier, is fucking brutal and nasty. That whole first impetigo album is brutal and nasty, and it comes highly recommended. It's an album that had a lot of problems coming out. Uh, they went through multiple versions of the album cover because they kept getting censored, and uh, I mean, it's to be expected given what the cover art looks like. Oh no! There's actually a whole lot of stories about how much of a bear was getting this album finally put out that I don't even really have the time to tell you today. What I will say is that Steve O'Dobbins, the main guy behind Impetigo, is a very well-spoken, humorous, and rather talkative man that has explained the entire history of this album in depth, both in the liner notes of the Razorback Ultimate Edition that I personally own, as well as in like the wealth of interviews that are available with the guy on YouTube. Suffice to say, they didn't let it discourage them too much, because a couple years later they managed to get out Horror of the Zombies, which I believe cements their place as one of the most artistic purveyors of gore grind within the entire genre, at least as far as it comes to structuring the whole album with this sort of epic narrative. It doesn't start out sounding like it's going to be that much of a leap in sound from Ultimo Mondo Cannibale on the first song. My victims never knew what was going to happen. The wonderfully catchy Boneyard, and apart from the production being a little bit more professional sounding and the vocals being a little bit more understandable, it's very much in the vein of the Ultimo Mondo Kinabale sound. But if you listen under the surface, the songwriting itself is a little bit more polished. This is almost like the perfect grindcore pop song. It's like grindcore's breaking the law. But then that second song hits you. You look at the runtime on the CD and you're like, holy shit, this is seven minutes long. And let me tell you, it earns that length. I hate people, man. I don't care. I don't give a shit. I don't give a shit about nothing. Nah. All my life, people fuck with me. Don't you fuck with me, man. I just fucking hate people. 
the wonderfully entitled I Work for the Street Cleaner, which starts off with this downright catchy, surprisingly melodic riff, leading us into the swampy, very doomy sounding grind. The song might be seven minutes long, but it doesn't really feel like it because there's so many different sections and changes. This is kind of the peak of Speedo's lyrical delivery being in like very poetic stanzas, or certain meditations on the nature of violence and misanthropy. Each lyrical couplet even rhymes with itself, and the vocals are surprisingly understandable for how bizarre they are. This segue point up right here really shows up how dynamic the drum performance is, where he comes in with these blasty bits, and then as the riff slows down, he switches it up to mark out each individual specific note before launching into almost this sort of like weird evil surf rock riff, which itself is a bit of a gotcha. They don't stick on it for too long before immediately using it as a launching point for a very spastic, very heavy grind break. Like right now they're kind of leaning into the groove and then they decide to take a trip off to Wacko Land. It's a very abrupt tempo change right in the middle of the riff. You know, just when we thought they were getting a little too doomy to be proper grind for, that shit happens. The guitar solo section on this song is similarly deceptively constructed where it starts out super chaotic and nasty, very dissonant before coming around to actually harmonize with that melodic riff from the beginning of the song. Based. So I work for the street cleaner definitely earns that seven minute long runtime with all the different bizarre changes it has in it. But even the shorter songs on this album tend to pack in a whole lot of material. But more important than the amount of material is the memorability of said material. All of these songs are, for lack of a better term, very song-like, very intentionally constructed, very artistic. You might have noticed that I've been much more intentional including the movie samples in these songs. And that's because... And that's because I feel like the samples on this album are much more integral to the music's construction as opposed to just being there to set atmosphere. Speaking of atmosphere, this absolutely sepulchral doomy riff that we're hitting transitioning into one of the nastiest groove riffs ever put to grindcore. In fact, it's almost hard to call this music grindcore anymore, but I honestly don't know what else you would call it. It's If it's death metal, it's way weirder and messier than most death metal you're ever going to hear. If it's grindcore, I don't know, man. These songs run on a little bit too long and have way too many tempo changes. It's just kind of like this whole unique style they've got to themselves. And that is typified by this sort of multi-song suite that initiates side B of this album on vinyl. It's three songs that are kind of put together in a concept entitled Cannibale Ballet, Trap Them and Kill Them, and Cannibal Lust. And the way it starts off, it's like... <laughs> We don't even need movie samples. We'll make our own movie samples. And they do this whole wacky soundscape thing, layering in different, I don't know, something out of National Geographic with all these weird death growling noises, screams of pain, tribal drums. Then Trap Them and Kill Them kicks in with some more of that dark gore grind poeticism. Eerie stanzas uttered over doom metal riffs before launching into their signature hyperspeed grindcore. This guy's like the Tom Araya of yelling a whole bunch of shit at once, just in a more death metal grindcore context. And the song kind of jumps back and forth between these two polar extremes. Really gives a sense of dread of impending carnage, followed by the inaction of said carnage. The fast riffs on this song in particular seem to have a whole lot of master influence, underscored by... Stevo utilizing a classic Paul Speckman catchphrase. The way this song ends is really spectacular. Just total sudden death type shit. My head is severed at the neck of all silently to the ground. I mean, it's kind of silly, kind of gross, and kind of morbid all at the same time. Whatever it is, it gives me chills. Now, Stevo from Impetigo's favorite song on this album is Staff Terrorist, which, um, look up the lyrics to that if you want to have a good time. Let's throw this stuff. A dab will do ya. However, in terms of emotional impact, the singular song on this album for me is the seven minute long closer Breakfast at the Manchester Morgue. <laughs> Positively ghastly poetry from Mr. Dobbins on this one. Even in the context of how great Impetigo's lyrics usually are, this is a cut above. And it's all in the service of building up to the fastest, nastiest, grooviest, thrashiest thrash section Impetigo would ever do. So thrashy, in fact, that before it starts, he feels the need to yell 
we're hitting you with this absolute barrage of chunky groove thrash riffs. This shit just does not stop. And even when it goes back into the grindier bits, they're sort of included as glue between different bits of thrash riffs. It's a really interesting synthesis of two very different aspects of their sound before collapsing in all sorts of noisiness. Because it's impetigo, it's gore grind at its absolute filthiest. And yet, hopefully, as I've demonstrated to you over the course of this episode, it's also grindcore at its most high-minded and artistic. There's really not much out there that sounds like this. Even the projects these guys did after Impetigo didn't really hit that same level of strangeness. A lot of them were very good, notably Steve O'Dobbins had a band called Church of Misery, but not the Japanese band Church of Misery. That band actually took their name from this band who only did a handful of very underground death doom demos in the early 90s. It's similar to how Anatomia, Grudge, and Coffins did a split called Doom to Death, Damned in Hell that was named after a very unknown song by the very unknown autopsy side project doomed. Maybe that's why I like so much Japanese stuff is because they seem to be very good at understanding and paying tribute to music that is very misunderstood by the metal scene at large. Later on as the retro death thing kind of picked back up, he also had a band called Tombstones with Wayne from Decrepitaph and Eternal Suffering and Patrick from Crypticus. And he's currently active in a band called Surgical with a whole host of death metal revivalist fiends. But in Patigo, I'd put him up there with Macabre in terms of creating a really unique sound that has a whole lot going for it that most people will probably hate because your stupid minds stupid stupid present listenership accepted of course i'm sure everybody here is a giant impetigo fan after listening to me rattle on about them for the past 15 minutes but even if you're not hopefully you enjoyed learning about them thanks so much for watching or listening or whatever you did now if you excuse me everyone's favorite spooky broad himari just put out a new solo album and i got to go listen to that stuff. So I'll see you next time. You say we hit him with a brick. Still going, this asshole.